Now you eat, you eat some chicken, let's say. Okay, so you eat some chicken. So this is chicken protein, let's say. Bam. Chicken protein, chicken. Okay. What is that chicken made out of? From a macronutrient perspective, it's also made out of protein, correct. What is proteins made out of? Amino acids, right? So this enzyme, this enzyme will attach to this chicken protein and break it down into amino acids that the body can then use to make into more proteins and amino acids. Yes, exactly. That's the crucial part. We haven't talked about absorption yet. We've only talked about digestion, right? So enzymes, which are made out of proteins, which are made out of amino acids, they are responsible for breaking down protein that we eat into amino acids. And then those amino acids are absorbed by the body. And then the body cells turn those absorbed amino acids into other proteins that they use. So basically it breaks down into amino acids that can be reused exactly, exactamundo. Lesson four is about how uh, it helps. Yes, exactly. Well, the second part of lesson four is about absorption. We're still talking about digestion here. This day is focusing entirely on digestion because in the duodenum, that's where 90% of that digestion happens. Tomorrow's lesson, we will talk about absorption. Yeah, no worries. Good questions. The overall question, in case some of you weren't, were wondering, was can you just kind of go over enzymes and proteins? And, and we did. And this occurs in the duodenum. The... Um, the breaking down, yes. I will talk about how protein gets broken down in the duodenum here because it kind of started in the stomach, right? If you remember from lesson three, pepsin is responsible for breaking protein down in the stomach, but it really continues in the duodenum among other things. And we'll get into that in just a second. Because you'll see here, there's a lot that goes on with regards to the duodenum. It is a complex system of organs and uh, enzymes and many different things. Uh, sir, there are 20 amino acids in a protein that are essential for our body. Correct. And we make 12 of them. We can make 12 of them. So from just the, the naturally occurring elements in our body, we can make 12 of the 20 amino acids. So as long as you eat vegetables, you can make those 12 amino acids. But there are eight amino acids that our body cannot make, and we need to eat and consume them from high-protein uh, vegetables and, if you eat meat, high-protein meat. Does that make sense, Kyle? So like if you had very low protein meals and you just ate like, I don't know, salad, which has still some protein in it technically, but not a lot, from those nutrients, your body could make 12 of the 20 amino acids, even though it doesn't have access to protein because it can synthesize it. But the other eight, you need to consume. Otherwise, you're out of luck. You're a goner. You learn more about that in cellular biology in second and third year, Kyle, even a little bit in grade 12 bio. Um, it's not something we really get into. It's a little bit above our pay grade, so to speak. But what isn't above our pay grade, segue, segue, you're welcome, segue, uh, is learning about the accessory organs that are going to assist 
with chemical digestion in the duodenum. So as I alluded to earlier, there are a lot of accessory organs that help with digestion in the duodenum because the duodenum can't do it by itself. It needs to rely on its pals. Oh dear. My chair is all over the place today. It needs to rely on its pals to help out. And the duodenum utilizes many different organs for that digestion. So we're gonna look at a couple of them today in some detail. So the first organ that we're gonna look at is the liver. The liver is responsible for producing a chemical that helps with fat digestion, and that is bile. Now, it's important to realize bile is not an enzyme. It's just going to help with the digestion of fat. And it does so by way of what's called emulsification. If you've ever mixed oil and water or oil and vinegar before, you'll notice that the oil pools in one blob, the vinegar pools at the bottom, and they don't really mix very well. What needs to happen is emulsification. So you add some mayonnaise, you add some mustard, you add um, garlic, you can add anything that has something that allows for the fat. And then if you mix it all up together, it emulsifies and the fat turns from one giant globule into a bunch of tiny little globules. And that's what emulsification is. The bile is responsible for emulsifying the fat and turning the large chunk or piece of fat into a bunch of tiny, 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 tiny pieces of fat. And that allows for the digestion of that fat later on in the process, okay? So bile produced by the liver, and it is responsible for emulsifying fat. So bile can be released directly into the duodenum by way of the hepatic duct, okay? The hepatic duct is a tube that connects the liver to the small intestine. So the bile is produced in the liver and it's directly secreted into the duodenum. Excess bile can also be stored via the hepatic duct in what's called the gall bladder. The gall bladder will store the bile for when it is needed later on. So when it is needed later on, the gall bladder can contract and release that bile into the duodenum to help out with regards to emulsification of fat. And the reason being is that imagine you have a, um, let's say fish and chips. I've been craving fish and chips, oh God, for the last two years. I haven't been able to have good fish and chips since the pandemic started because it's something you need to have at a restaurant or at a, at a pub or something. Uh, so I haven't had fish and chips in a very long time. I've been thinking about it recently. And fish and chips is a high fat meal. It's deep fried. It's fish, fatty fish. It's a batter that usually contains fat. It's French fries, which are deep fried. There's a lot of fat in it. The beautiful thing about the gallbladder is that it stores bile. If I did not have a gallbladder and I ate my beautiful fish and chips, the liver would struggle to keep up with production of bile to help with emulsification of fat. So the fat would go through my system in a giant glob instead of the tiny droplets that's required for it to be digested. But since the gallbladder is able to store that bile en masse, once a large fat meal is taken in and my stomach says, hey, duodenum, I got some chyme in here and it's got a lot of fat in there. The gallbladder can go, oh, sweet, okay. And release all that excess stored up bile to help with emulsification, which will then in turn help with the digestion of fat. So the gallbladder stores large quantities of bile for later and the liver produces it and stores that bile within the gallbladder or directly secretes it into the duodenum by way of the hepatic duct. Alrighty, questions about the liver or the gallbladder, I should say, either or. Give you all a second to write some stuff down. I'm sure some of you will have one or two questions and if not, that's okay. You can always ask them later on. This is a lot of content to digest, no pun intended. Ah, oh, just kidding, pun intended. So if you need some time to take a look at it, by all means, I'm more than happy to give you that time. Does that little star say that bile is not an enzyme? Correct, it does. Bile is not an enzyme. Oh, so many check marks, thank you. Yes. It is not an enzyme, not an enzyme.
The red stuff again. What do you mean the red stuff? The fat and emulsification? Okay. Have you ever mixed oil and water before? Okay. Um, well, this is a hard. <laughs> Let's say yes. Okay. When you mix oil and water, and then whatever, whatever you're having for dinner tonight, I'm assuming you're not going to make dinner, but if you are, whatever you're having with dinner tonight, get a small bit of water and a small bit of oil and mix it in like a glass, okay? If you try to mix it up, it will not mix. It will not mix, okay? It won't. It's not possible. If you continue to mix it up, it goes from a giant glob of oil and a clump of water and the oil becomes these tiny, tiny, tiny little droplets. And then if you add something like mustard, for example, it will what do what's called emulsify when you mix it, meaning the fat will break up into tiny, 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 tiny pieces. And then it will appear to be dissolved in the water. That's what bile does because chyme is mostly water. Okay. It's mostly water and acid, but mostly water. And in order for that fat to be broken down into tiny pieces so it can be digested later on, it needs to be emulsified or broken up into tiny, tiny globules by the bile. And that's what that diagram is, is saying. Does that make a bit more sense? All right. I see lots of uh, check marks. So thank you folks for the check marks. My hope is that this, oh dear, I've made a mistake. There we go. My hope is that the, the content is starting to make a little sense. And if not, that's okay. We will get into some more stuff that covers other ideas revolving around it. All right. Let's take a look at the pancreas now, because I'm going to introduce you to two words that if you stick in biology, specifically human anatomy and physiology, an animal anatomy physiology, you will learn and continue to learn about exocrine and endocrine functions. Okay. The first, the first exocrine, exocrine. It is the secretion into a body part. Okay, direct secretion. I should put direct in there. Direct uh, secretion directly into a body part. So one example, salivary glands, your salivary glands. It directly secretes saliva into your mouth, correct? The mucosa cells in your stomach directly secrete the acid, the pepsin, the mucus into your stomach, okay? It's directly secreted into that body part. The pancreas is also an exocrine organ. It directly secretes digestive enzymes that it makes. It directly secretes them into the duodenum for digestion. Does everyone what I understand what I mean by exocrine? Secretion, exo, or crine, sorry, secretion is crine, and then into a body part, exo. Exo is Greek for into something. And in this case, the pancreas directly secretes those enzymes into the duodenum. My hope is that makes sense. I've removed the check marks if you want to communicate to me that way. Oh dear, what have I done? Or if you have another way of asking about it, I'm happy to say it, talk about it differently, but my hope is that makes sense. Exocrine, directly into secretion. And in this case, directly into a body part. Alrighty, so let's take a look at some of the examples because here we need to recognize that again, the pancreas directly secretes by way of a duct into an organ, in this case, the duodenum. 
So it has three different enzymes, three different enzymes that it secretes. Bam, bam, bam. You will need to know these. The first, pancreatic amylase. Just like salivary amylase, pancreatic amylase digests starch. So any starch that was not broken down by saliva in the mouth is further digested by pancreatic amylase. You'll realize that there's a theme. Any starch digesting enzyme is called an amylase. I'll just make that connection. Amylase and starch, they always will go hand in hand, okay? Trypsin, just like pepsin, is responsible for digestion of proteins. Proteins, it's gonna break those proteins down into amino acids. Pepsin, trypsin, protein, protein, okay? So trypsin, just like its uh, friend pepsin, which we will talk about more later on, oops, responsible for breaking down proteins, proteins. And then lastly, lipase, lipases. As the name alludes, the beginning, not the end, lipase, lipids, lipids, also known as fats. So lipases, are going to break down those fatty acids or those lipids that are in our body or that are in our duodenum. And it's gonna break those down into fatty acid chains. And how will it break it down? As a result of the bile emulsifying it into tiny globules, which can then be digested by lipase. That's why that bile is so important, okay? All righty. So, exocrine directly secreted into a body part and then those directly secreted enzymes from the pancreas there are three different types pancreatic amylase trypsin and lipases Woo. okay take a minute or two here to write this down to think about it to ask questions and then i'll move on to the next part which is endocrine because spoiler alert the pancreas is also an endocrine organ For those of you that are tired at the end of a long day, take a minute, go splash some cold water on your face. We're just getting into the thick of it. And there's a lot of information here that I need you to digest. So if you're falling asleep at the wheel, go grab a tea, uh, go get some cold water splashing on your face. I have a very cold drink here to help wake me up a little. Um, you gotta be dialed in for this one. It's a tricky one. So go splash some water on your face, something that'll wake you up a bit. We're almost there. Only about 15 more minutes of this lesson. You need to be dialed in for it. Because this is not a, a unit where I'm just gonna have you uh, tell me what lipase is so you can just Google it in the middle of a quiz or whatever. This is something where you're gonna have to make those connections, okay? All right, take another minute, write stuff down, think of something. If you have questions, again, please let me know. All righty, let's talk about the next part of the pancreas and its function. Because as I said with endo, or sorry, with exocrine, we must also recognize that there is something called endocrine, endocrine. Now, this is a little trickier because the prefix here, endo, means something into liquid basically, which is secretion, of hormones into blood, okay? 
So this is the secretion of hormones into blood. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not a good spot for you. Man, there we go. So this is secretion of hormones into blood. Okay, so it's going to secrete the hormones insulin and glucagon, which is responsible for glucose storage. These hormones are really good at helping to control blood sugar levels. So it will release into the blood, not directly into a body part by ducts. So these endocrine systems or endocrine organs release hormones into the blood and they make their way all over the place in the body. And then they perform their function once they get to their desired location. So exocrine is directly into an organ via a duct. Endocrine is into the blood. Okay. I promise you, I promise you, I will ask you at least one question about these two concepts. Okay. All righty. I didn't even just realize I didn't send in my attendance. Whoopsies. Okay. Uh, what does it mean by glucose storage next to glucagon? Yeah. So glucagon is just good at helping your body store glucose or it's used for glucose storage. So if you have a chocolate brownie for breakfast or for breakfast, <laughs> if you have a chocolate brownie for lunch or with your lunch, like yours truly did today with a little bit of, of vanilla ice cream, mm, delicious. That was probably a little too much sugar or glucose. And so it was turned into glucagon, which is basically a hormone for lack of a better word. I would have one for breakfast. I know me too, uh, but I usually have my sourdough bread for breakfast. So, cause I made a really good loaf the other day. That's normally what I have for breakfast. All righty. Are there any questions with regards to exo or endocrine? As you guessed, it is a kind of an important deal. What I normally have on my sourdough, it depends. Sometimes I'm feeling like a toad in the hole, which is just a, a fried egg inside of the bread. So then I fry the bread and the egg in, in, in butter. It's delicious. Sometimes I just have it with butter. Sometimes I have it with almond butter, peanut butter, marmalade, peanut butter and jam. Uh, what else do I have with it? That's usually it. I try to keep it varied. Oh, butter and honey is another really good one. Butter and honey, strong recommend. Yeah, it's called toad in a hole. Look it up. It's a British thing, I think. Oh, I 100% agree to hear. Almond butter with a little salt. Oh, so good. It's also like eight times more expensive though. So pros and cons, you know, pros and cons. But yeah, toad in a hole, it's like a British breakfast thing. It's you cut a hole in the bread and then you fry the bread in butter. So you fry one side of the bread in butter, flip it over, crack an egg into the hole in that bread and then fry the egg in the bread and the rest of the bread. I usually put a hat on it and then uh, it steams the egg so that it's fully cooked, but still has a runny yolk. Delicious, delicious. Oof, now I'm gonna have one for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, egg and bread, fried egg and bread for breakfast is a, uh, for me, it's a Mr. Ketosol special. I used to love, it's probably one of the first things I learned how to cook now that I think about it. Fried egg and toast. And you're like, wow, that's so easy. But yeah, it's, it's a skill, it's, it takes, time to master it. And I think it's, uh, it's good. All right. Anyways, long story short, we're talking about digestion now. So 
Let's talk about hormones some more, because as I alluded to with regards to endocrine, right? Those of you who are paying attention noticed that with regards to exocrine, it's usually talking about enzymes, right? When you take a look at the things that are producing in the exocrine, in digestion, they are enzymes, salivary amylase, pepsin, trypsin, lipase, uh, pancreatic amylase. All of those are enzymes secreted by the exocrine system that is the pancreas or other exocrine systems. Endocrine, which secretes into the blood, is dealing with hormones. Remember, hormones are chemical messengers that are going to travel throughout the entire body, and they allow organs to communicate with each other. There are two main hormones that are secreted by the duodenum, and this is very crucial. You have to know them, and they come from the duodenum. Okay, So the duodenum controls the pancreas and the liver by way of two hormones. The first, the first is cholecystokinin or CCK. CCK is responsible for communicating with the pancreas once chyme enters the duodenum. So on our journey of the food that we are talking about, we've eaten the food, we've chewed the food, it's in our stomach. Once it mixes and becomes chyme, it goes through that sphincter, that pyloric sphincter at the end of your stomach, and it enters the duodenum. Once it enters the duodenum, okay, the duodenum releases CCK or cholecystokinin. And the duodenum releases that CCK into the blood, and it eventually makes its way to the pancreas. This CCK tells the pancreas, hey man, we just got some snacks and I need you to secrete your hormones as well as your enzymes to help with digestion. The pancreas says, sure thing, CCK. Thanks. Say hi to your, uh, your friend Duodenum for me. And then the pancreas secretes those hormones and enzymes that we just finished talking about. Okay. Does everyone understand the steps involved in that process? Yeah, I'll repeat it one more time. So CCK, it is produced by the duodenum, okay? Where it acts as a, or where it's produced as a result of chyme entering the duodenum, okay? So as the stomach releases that chyme into the duodenum, that duodenum releases CCK into our blood, okay? Remember, it's a hormone. It goes into our blood travels all over the place, pew, 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 pew. but it eventually makes its way to the pancreas. It then tells the pancreas, hey, pancreas, I'm CCK. You need to release your hormones and your enzymes to help with digestion. And the pancreas says, sure thing, no problem. And it, the pancreas directly secretes its hormones into the blood, or it directly secretes the enzymes into the duodenum. Whew. Okay. A lot to learn at the end of the day. Yes. Does the dual den release CCK? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's the duodenum that releases CCK. And CCK does many things in the body, but the main thing we are focusing on is it's is is it's um stimulation of the pancreas. If you Google CCK, it tells you all the different things, but we're just focusing on its pancreas interaction. Okay. All right. Does everyone have a general idea about CCK? I see one or two check marks. Can't tell if they're okay. Good. Couple of check marks. Uh, wait, so the CCK, CCK releases from the duodenum, it goes to the pancreas, and either the pancreas will either produce exocrine or endocrine. No, no, no. Okay. CCK is released into the blood, right? 
released into the blood. Eventually, it makes its way to the pancreas. Okay. It eventually makes its way to the pancreas where it says, hey, pancreas, we need help digesting this food that's in chyme. We got to get these nutrients. And remember, the pancreas is both exocrine and an endocrine organ. So it will directly secrete those enzymes into the duodenum, right? That pancreatic amylase, the lipase, the trypsin, it directly secretes those enzymes into the duodenum to help with digestion. But it also secretes hormones into the blood, the insulin as well as the glucagon. And those hormones are going to help with regards to managing blood sugar level. It's a lot. So how does this exocrine and endocrine work together? Because hormones are going to stimulate different organs. Remember, hormones tell other organs what to do, right? Whereas the exocrine component is direct secretion of enzymes into the part that needs it. Right? So there's a lot of different moving parts that it's contributing to. Exocrine and endocrine systems work together to help digestion. That makes a bit of sense? Okay, cool. So to further, to further your brain's absorption of this information, there's another hormone. There's another hormone that the duodenum produces. And it is what's called prosecretin, which then eventually becomes secretin, okay? So when that acidic chyme enters the duodenum from the stomach, it will activate prosecretin. So prosecretin is that hormone that's just chilling in the duodenum or in the cells of the duodenum. And once it is exposed to acid, it turns into secretin. This secretin is released into the blood because it's a hormone and it will stimulate the liver to produce more bile. And it will also talk to the pancreas and say, hey man, you gotta also secrete lipase and trypsin. So not only is CCK telling the pancreas to secrete these enzymes, but secretin is also telling the pancreas to secrete these enzymes. So we have two different hormones interacting with the liver and the, uh, the pancreas in an attempt to say, hey, we need help with digestion. Please secrete these enzymes. Okay. So that's one function of secretin. It's another hormone that works with the liver and the pancreas to secrete their necessary digestive uh, helpers. For the liver, it's bile, and for the pancreas, it's lipase and trypsin. Now, you'll take note, we're missing one digestive enzyme that the pancreas makes. What digestive enzyme is that? Good, the salivary amylase. So if secretin, tells the pancreas to secrete lipase and trypsin, where does the salivary amylase come from, do you think? Ooh, nope, good guess though. So. Remember, remember, sal or, um, pancreatic amylase is produced in the pancreas. So what would tell the pancreas to secrete that uh, pancreatic amylase? If it's not secretin, It's CCK, right? Remember, CCK is going to tell the pancreas to release digestive enzymes and hormones. And the one enzyme that it tells it to secrete is the one that's not listed below, which is pancreatic amylase. It requires you to connect the dots a little, but that's okay. So the hormone stimulates also hormone. Yes, it does. 
CCK stimulates. Yeah, there are hormones that stimulate more hormones. Correct. You don't really learn about hormone cascading events, but in this in this course, but yes, hormones can tell organs to secrete more hormones. Basically, this entire process just adds more enzymes, needs to break down food, and they all work together. Exactly, Tanya. That's the overall idea. It's just the specifics are, uh, there's a lot of mental gymnastics, so to speak. All right, any other questions about secretin? All righty, let's look at the next function of secretin because secretin has two roles. The first, to tell the liver and the pancreas to secrete their necessary digestive helpers, either bile or an enzymes. But it also is responsible for telling the pancreas to secrete bicarbonate ions. These bicarbonate ions are very important as they neutralize the pH of chyme. Remember, chyme leaving the stomach starts out with a pH of around two and a half, which is very acidic. In the stomach, it is protected from that acid due to the fact of the mucosa cells that exist in the, in the stomach. But in the duodenum, there is no mucus. There is no mucus. So that pH of two and a half is very harmful to the duodenum. So these bicarbonate ions will help raise the pH to nine approximately. And it will also effectively slow down digestion because as it secretes these bicarbonate ions and the acidity level of the chyme increases or it, it no longer becomes acidic, it's going to slow down digestion, specifically of the enzymes that were responsible for breaking down protein in the stomach. So it will regulate the rate of digestion and that in turn prevents more chyme from entering the duodenum until digestion is fully completed in the duodenum. So it not only helps to protect the duodenum, it is also going to help regulate digestion. So if you recall, the pyloric sphincter is responsible for contracting and opening to let chyme in, or sorry, let chyme out of the stomach or stop it from leaving. Once the pH is at two and a half, these bicarbonate ions actually tell the pyloric sphincter to close up shop, and then it does not send any more chyme in. And once those bicarbonate ions raise the pH sufficiently enough, the pyloric sphincter can open up again and let more chyme into the duodenum, which will then continue the digestion process. All righty. So the last stage, folks, we're almost there. I know your brains are full of information from the day, and I know you're tired, but we're almost there. We're almost there. All right. Any questions with regards to bicarbonate or secretin? Because that's the end of the secretin, so to speak. We'll talk a little bit more about what uh, the next steps are, but secretin questions. So wait, when the pH increases, that means it is fully digested. Uh, yes. Yes, or it's it's slowing down digestion a little bit. And we'll talk about what that means because if you recall, well, maybe I'll just talk about it now. Maybe I'll just talk about it now. One second, let me. Ba, 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 ba. Because if you recall, we haven't quite talked about one digestive enzyme yet. So when we look at the idea of digestion slowing down, it's mainly because of one enzyme that's triggered by an acidic environment. If you recall from the stomach, the increased P 
pH in the duodenum will actually deactivate pepsin because recall, pepsin needs that acidic environment in order to digest protein. So as the pH rises, it actually slows down digestion, right? So as you said, Arpitha, once the pH starts to increase, digestion is actually slowing down, which is bad. We don't want digestion to slow down, but we also can't afford to have the duodenum exposed to a very acidic environment. So it's stuck, right? It's stuck. It doesn't want to get hurt, but it also needs to digest things. And pepsin needs that acidic environment to digest protein. So what ends up happening is that as we are preventing damage to the duodenum by rising pH or increasing the pH, there's another protein complex or enzyme complex called trypsinogen, which is inactive until, until the pH rises. And once the pH rises, it activates that trypsinogen to trypsin, which allows the continuation of digestion of proteins to break them down into those single amino acid chains, boop, just like that. So even though the rising pH slows down digestion, because trypsin is released as a result of that pH rising, and it actually functions in a higher pH, we see digestion continue back up and full digestion will complete at around pH eight and a half to nine. So you are right, Arpitha. Once the pH rises to eight and a half, nine, then that means digestion of that uh, chyme is done. Where is trypsinogen released? Remember, trypsinogen or trypsin is released by the pancreas as a result of that secretin stimulation. That's okay. That's what I'm here for. And you got to ask those questions in order to be 100% sure, right? All righty. So as Arpitha alluded to, once the chyme is completely digested, it will leave the duodenum. So at this point, once this chyme leaves the duodenum, it is seen as completely digested. No more digestion is happening past the duodenum. Only absorption, which is what we will carry on with tomorrow. Whew, we made it, folks. All righty. I was so confused at first because I forgot pH is more basic. <laughs> yeah, higher pH is higher basic. Lower pH is acidic. Okay. All righty. So, folks, that is it for this lesson. We will continue with lesson four tomorrow, absorption. My hope is that absorption is a little less of a mind job as it is. I get that you're all tired. Um, but you know, the last period is just as important as your first period of the day. So try to find a way to get up for it. Like I said, splash some water on your face, get some cold to drink, take a nap at lunch, whatever it is that helps you get up and mentally focus for the last period of the day. Uh, come ready for it tomorrow as we finish this last lesson before our, uh, our quiz on Friday. Wait, confused. Why is a pH of nine means digestion is complete? Yeah, because as digestion completes, the bicarbonate ions are released in order to, to further allow for that trypsin to digest things. So once the, the bicarbonate ion completely neutralizes that chyme, once it reaches complete neutralization, that usually means that digestion is complete because it takes time. Yeah, it happens slowly. It's not, it's not all released at once and completely neutralized all at once. It's a slow process. It usually takes about 45 minutes. Because remember, remember, Okay, secretin is secreted, it's a, it's a hormone, right? And those hormones that are secreted into the bloodstream, it actually takes time to get to the necessary organs, specifically in this case, the pancreas, right? Once a hormone is secreted, it takes anywhere from 20 to 35 minutes to get from the bloodstream to the necessary uh, part 
of the body, in this case, the pancreas. So then the bicarbonate ions are released and about 10, 15 minutes later, it's uh, completely neutralized from 2.5 to 9 pH. Okay. Yeah, great question. That's a really good question. Tahira, 10 points to your house. Great question. Especially at the end of the day where your brain is a little bit shot. Uh, can you repeat this, repost this lesson? There was a lot of good questions and explanation in the lesson that I didn't. Yeah, for sure. I'll post this lesson to, uh, to our drive. Because I agree, there were a lot of really good questions. My other sections have really good questions too, but this one I think had, had really good questions. I might post all of them because I'm sure some of the people will be happy to see all of the different questions for the individual class. So. All right, folks, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, so I will stick around to answer any and all questions if you got them. If you want to stick around and ask those questions, by all means, I'm happy to answer them, okay? Uh, I know this is a lot of content. Take a breather and uh, rest up. Maybe take a nap, have some snacks, whatever it is. Go for a walk outside. It's beautiful out there. Refocus and then get some more studying and reviewing done tonight because you got your work cut out for you over the next four days before the quiz on Friday, okay, folks? If you're headed out, I will see you all 